It's um, a digital art project in which I take the greatest paintings throughout history, Mona Lisa, Scream, uh, Rembrandt's Night Watch, Starry Night, and I ruin them in some way. Do we have the picture? So you're never going to be able to own the birth of Venus, but you could own the birth of Venus torn in the middle and ruined. And so throughout this project, I'm going to just try and ruin the great artworks of all time, mostly for fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm working on. Full disclosure, I did use a little bit of generative AI in the process of making these ruin masterpieces, and generative AI is what we're going to talk about today. I'm extremely happy to have with me uh, Walter Woodman from Toronto Shy Kids. He is one third, he is 33.3% of Shy Kids, is that right? Correct, I am 33.3% of Shy Kids. Exactly, and just give us an overview of, of what Shy Kids is, and what you guys do. Shy Kids is a group of creatives uh, that work all over different creative uh, projects. Um, the one that we are best known for and probably going to talk about most today is working on Airhead. Uh, has anyone seen that film, Airhead? One person in the front row. Well, you're going to see Two people well. in the back row. Well, we're about to show it to you. Um, yeah. But before we, get, before we get into that, sure. so we're going to focus today on generative AI and particularly on new technologies coming like Sora and Runway and Flux is, I think, a new one that's coming. And Walter's here because uh, Shy Kids was given the opportunity to play around with Sora, which hasn't been commercially released yet. Just for those of you who don't know, Sora is a text-to-video engine. So you type... A thousand light bulbs fall in slow motion onto a ballroom floor whilst a fireplace flickers in the background, and it makes a video of that that's pretty close to photorealistic. So, Walter, tell me, first off, how did you get approached by OpenAI uh, to be one of the testers of Sora? Sure. So, the way that we uh, spoke to OpenAI um, was we made an installation for a film called uh, Dolly Land, uh, it was about the life of Salvador Dali, but we made an installation in the uh, lobby of the St. Regis Hotel that was uh, meant to look like Salvador Dali's studio, and then people could enter in a like an idea of what they wanted to see, like a flamingo in roller skates or whatever, and then we would project that uh, image onto the... Uh, canvas of this place and that was at a time when people were like very unfamiliar with OpenAI and um, and Dali was just coming out at that time and that's when uh, the OpenAI team saw us and they said hey what kind of stuff do you guys do and then we, we showed them our work and they said wow that's really in line with stuff that we like and then they said hey we're releasing this new technology called Sora do you guys want to play around with it? And we did. And, yeah. So we're going to see a bit of it. First off, uh, OpenAI released a compilation video showing some of the prompts that people had made. That was the first thing that kind of blew everybody's mind because someone wrote as a text prompt, uh, a litter of golden retrievers plays in the snow, followed by a photorealistic video of that. The next thing was they released a bunch of short films uh, the absolute standout of that was Airhead by Shy, Shy Kids, and we're going to see it now. It's only a minute long, but we're going to watch it now. Thing is, I am literally filled with 
Okay, amazing. So, yeah, big round of applause. And, th and I think one of the reasons this one stood out from the others was it had a playfulness, it had a, a funniness to it, it had a lightness, no pun intended, to it. Uh, so talk, to me through, uh, talk me through a little bit the process of, of how you guys made it. Um, so yeah, so the way that we made it was very interesting. So um, first you have to like come up with an idea and the basis of our idea was something that's very hard with AI generated things is to create consistency of a character. Um, has anyone watched the film Air Bud? Air Bud? Air Bud? Yeah. So, like, it's very easy in a film, if your main character is a golden retriever, to have multiple golden retrievers play the same part. But it's very difficult if the human's face keeps changing. So, a big thing that we were thinking about was, like, how can we come up with an idea that plays to the strengths of the limitation. So one of the limitations was it was very hard to create a consistent character. So for us, we said, why don't we have a character that is like very obvious and like you're not gonna pay attention to their body shape changing because they have a very obvious sort of problem or defect. And for us, we picked a balloon for a head because it was just something that I like drew in a sketchbook but then like beyond that, it kind of made me feel the way that Sora, using Sora made me feel. It kind of felt like my head was like filling up with all these ideas. And so once you have your main character, you can begin to be like, okay, well, what's his problems? What does he go through in a day? What happens when he has to go to the cactus store? Because his girlfriend sends him out to the cactus store. And... We wrote the script quite quickly, um, and then we began generating images. For, our, for this project in particular, we wanted to limit it to exclusively Sora-generated images. Um, so yeah, we just started saying, you know, a man with a balloon for his head goes on vacation. A man for a balloon with his head goes to the pyramids, goes whatever. And like, we just kept prompting and editing, and then there was some slight, um, after effects. After effects and things like that, and just like making sure all the images looked consistent. Um, but that was the main that was the main process. So when you type a man with a yellow balloon for a head walks slowly through a cactus shop, how close was what came out to what we saw there? Like how much did you find that you had to kind of revise the prompts or it depends. It was like a complete slot machine. So we would do it one time and it would be like, oh my gosh, that is perfect. And then other times it would be very bad. And, and one thing that we learned, for example, in speaking to computers, as I'm sure everyone here can relate to, sometimes it's not about what you say, but what you don't say. And so if we said something like a man with a balloon instead of a face, it would make a face because you're saying face as opposed to, you know, it's like watching your parents Google something. It's like, you, you just need to say coffee, college, open now, as opposed to what co coffee shop is open in college right now. So it's like, I think a lot of it was about learning what not to say. And I think to make that film, we probably had thousands of generations, maybe 2,000 clips that we actually generated to make that one minute piece. So you can imagine it's like endless iterations and different versions, etc. And even on the consistency front, the yellow balloon was like different shades of yellow, different sizes of balloon in, from shot to shot, right? Yeah, we thought it would be really cool if the balloon, depending on its emotion, changed its color. So like if he was mad, he would be red. And if he was sad, he would be blue. Um, but then we're like, okay, let's just make it all yellow. And then I realized afterwards that the emoji for balloon is red. Anyways, I'll save now, for the sequel. Yes. Um, generative AI is controversial in film. 
a, a lot of filmmakers haven't had the chance to play around with something like uh, a lot of filmmakers haven't had the chance to play around with something like Sora, and there is uh, anticipation, discussion about what it might lead to in the film industry. We've seen articles like Tyler Perry said he was going to build an $800 million studio in Atlanta, and then he saw a demonstration of Sora from AI, and he canceled plans to do that because he thinks it's that radically going to change people's abilities in terms of what they can make without needing studios, green screens. What are your thoughts about the ways that people will use this and how it will impact the film, TV, and video content industries? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, I think some of the fears are valid. You know, like, I make art because I want to make more art and combine with people who make art. But I think it's really interesting that a place like blockchain futurist conference embraces these AI technologies. And the reason being is I think a lot of everyone out here has the same problems as we have, right? It's like there's this massive industry that feels like somewhat impenetrable. And there's these insurgent upstarts that are trying to break through a like common wisdom or like common way that things are done. And I think personally for me, I think there's like 10 people who get to make blockbusters every year. And I am very curious what the kid in like Bangladesh wants to make and like, that kid can't make Avatar mainly because of financial restrictions. And so what happens when the playing field is even? And then we're going to go into storytelling. Because if everyone can make Avatar, then we're not just going to go watch Avatar because it's a multi-billion dollar film. We're going to go watch Avatar because it has a great story and a great use of technology. So I think the democratization of technology in general for film has always been positive and like that's the thing that excites me is like what is that kid what's that kid's avatar look like as opposed to like James Cameron which we've which we've seen yeah absolutely and i think throughout the history of hollywood every time there has been a major technological development it has served to make the uh, pond wider for more people to, to play around in. You know, the move from large studio controlled cameras to smaller handheld cameras let more people make films. The move from film to digital, expensive film stock to cheap digital footage allowed more people to make uh, films. The uh, things like the Sundance Film Festival, YouTube, these uh, uh, Vimeo, these have all given people new outlets to program their own work without having to have gatekeepers say what you can and can't watch. Things like Indiegogo have allowed for crowdfunding, and I think absolutely your point that it's, you know, I have quite strong feelings on this. I think that it's really quite arrogant to think that people in South Sudan and Somalia don't also have a head full of ideas and a heart full of passion and couldn't make incredible films just like Western filmmakers could if they had the chance. Totally. And like beyond that, like I'm assuming everyone has a phone, right? How many of you are photographers, you know? Like just because you have the, a camera doesn't make you a photographer in the same way as just because you have access to making images doesn't mean you're a filmmaker. Like... Um, that film itself, the reason whether it worked for you or didn't work is probably based on our storytelling ability, not our access to technology. And I believe that like, that is the core, that is the hard thing. It's like, what is the actual story? And like, yeah, like go on Instagram. Just because everyone has a phone doesn't mean they're all photographers. But there are some people that cut through the noise. And I really believe that we are going to have a, a lot more film being made at a lot higher caliber, which is going to mean a lot more crap. We also have oh, to yeah. like... There's going to be a lot of bad art. Yeah, like there's a lot of bad art already. I don't know if you've like been to the theater recently, but like, yeah, like there's a lot well, of shit. It's something like 40% of the 8 billion videos on YouTube have zero views. 
Exactly. And it's like, for me, I am a person who thinks the cream is going to rise to the top. Yep. And I'm just excited to see what those different people have to say. Because I think that for a long time, those people have went unheard. And I think that the true place that you find originality and great storytelling is, is on the margins. And so access to Sora, to somebody on the margins, I'm very curious what, they, what they're going to make and what they're going to do. Now, we, we talked a bit the other day about industries that are likely to be a bit impacted by this, or very impacted by this, and I think we said probably VFX artists, CGI artists, and storyboard artists. Do you think it's possible people in the beginning will use this to make sort of demo versions of their films or con proof of concept type things? Yeah, well, it's like very interesting to me that like the VFX artists, I got a lot of like go kill yourself comments from that video, um, which is fine. But a lot of it came from VFX artists, which our company does a lot of VFX. And for me, if you look 20 years ago, everyone was saying that VFX was the thing that was going to kill traditional filmmaking. If you look at 20 years ago, everyone said, oh my God, everything's on a green screen. You're totally ruining filmmaking. All the magic is gone. And they're, they're somewhat right. There's, there's an element well, there. Yeah. What, what will happen to the hand-drawn Disney movies? Sure. But then you're going to have companies like Ghibli who do the hand-drawn movies. And I believe, as with every single innovation in technology there is going to be some destruction of the way things are. And I, and I, don't, I don't find any joy in that. I, mm -hmm. I love the set painters. I love the people who change magazines and film cameras. I love film. That being said, I also think that, you know, no one would have predicted 20 years ago that there was a job called an influencer. And so th this talk about industries being destroyed feels like it eclipses all of the new industries that could come to be. And one of those, as you mentioned, is if I had this thing for, stor for storyboarding, I could say, instead of people, you know, producers going, hey, what does your story feel like? What does it look like? I could go, here's what it looks like. And, and even more so, I think something that was great in Airhead was in the writer's room it wasn't just a director saying, here's what we're going to do. Everyone was involved in the process and they could go, well, what if he did this? And you could actually see it. And I think that that to me, like I'm all about democratization of creativity, not exclusivity. So um, yeah, that's, that's what's exciting to me. Now, one area that has been quite contentious, which I'm, I'm very keen to get your opinion on, is that technologies like Sora are based on LLMs, large library models. And the big companies that are producing uh, generative AI and, and you know, LLM-based AI, like Anthropic and OpenAI, are not revealing the sources on which they are training the models. They're not saying whose footage is going into the libraries, and this has led to things like the New York Times wanting to sue OpenAI for using its articles, or you know, were, was its video engine trained upon YouTube videos or not? They won't say. What are your thoughts on the ethics of using generative AI video when it's not completely known what the sources were for the training of that, that video? I get it. I get the uh, hesitation of that. As a creative, you don't want to feel like your work is being stolen or ripped off. That being said, as an artist, I know how much, <laughs> what's the saying? Good artists take, great artists steal, something like this. I don't think that it should be the position of open AI to steal, but like, I think that looking forward into the future, the thing that I'm actually excited about is not when Sora is trained on every video to ever exist. What I'm actually excited about is when I can tell Sora, hey, never mind the history of cinema, 
Just look at my videos and train on just me. That to me is like a really interesting thing because like this idea of like we're trained on the entire internet, that's like kind of boring to me. What's really interesting is when I can work with a collaborator who knows me intimately and knows my work entirely. Um, so the ethics of that, I'm kind of, I think are still in the air and are still to be debated. I think like the ethics of open source creativity is still in the air. But for me personally, I'm excited about when it isn't trained on the world, but just trained on me and my organization specifically. I mean, one of the things a, a filmmaker said to me recently when I, I, I raised the topic with him was, you know, the ethics of using a created video of a golden retriever. And he said, well, if you take 100,000 photos of a golden retriever and feed them into a machine and over time it learns this part is the legs, this part is the tongue, this part is the ears. He said, that's kind of like if you gave me a pencil and asked me to draw a golden retriever, I've probably seen 100,000 golden retrievers in my life and what I'm drawing is based on what I have learned that a golden retriever looks like and that that's, you know, the process by which it's defining the objects that are scanned into it. Totally, and I think the true exciting part is what is the surreal element that can be brought into that. Like, and you said that, that some of the outtakes from uh, Airhead created hideous monsters. Hor horrible, like nightmare-inducing psychopathy. But like that for me is what's interesting. Like the advent of photography, that is when abstract expressionism came to be. And like, I think that we will enter an era of abstract expressionism because it's easy to make a golden retriever video now. So what's the story is like the real question. Like, so what? You can make a video of, an a, of a golden retriever. So what? Now what? And did you find like if you put in something that was kind of vague and abstract, like a monster walks through a nightmarish hellscape, what kind of things did you find that it would make? For the Vega Th that, sort of that stuff wasn't interesting. What was interesting is when you would say, what does love look like? Okay, and what, what does love look like? Please. <laughs> Are we supposed to do a demonstration? Or, um, the, I, that's the great question. What did it make? What did it make? It made these uh, like uh, buildings and water was like the main thing that I could see. But like, tell me what God looks like. Tell me what these things are. These are like the, the, the thing that I'm interested in. And like, for me, it's like, what can we dream up together? And thinking of the computer as a collaborator as opposed to a worker for you. I think that if you think of the, whatever it is, the LLM or whatever as a collaborator and someone who could surprise you and change the direction that you're going, that's what's most exciting to me. Far more exciting than like, yeah, go, go to a stock footage site if you want golden retrievers. Well, I'm interested. We have a few minutes to open it up for some questions if any of you have questions here. Again, it's extremely limited number of people who've had the opportunity to play around with Sora, so please do take advantage of Walter's knowledge. There's a young lady just here with a white cap. Do we have a microphone for her? There we go. Hey, um, I'm curious about different physics systems. Were you able to try out you like... Talk right uh, into it? Uh, were you able to try out like uh, this is what it looks like for actors to work on the moon, outer space, um, different types of gravity, asking for surreal physics, like you would try to like perfect with a video game engine or something? Yeah, that's a, that's a really awesome question. So like for me, a balloon is an amazing example of physics because like it wobbles and it moves and it kind of has this like floaty quality to it. So that's the re one of the other reasons why we did the, why we did that. In terms of like, again, slot machine. So sometimes I would say you're on a moon and in, in actuality a balloon would explode on the moon. Um, but it was like a lot of the times it felt like there was a subject and then the background would be a totally different physics to what that is. 
But that being said, it's like, it's like getting mad at a toddler for like its ability to do calculus. It's like, what? You didn't nail it? It's like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, give it a couple months. And I think that um, to the point that you're making, what's like truly exciting is to combine something real with a totally surreal element. So like physics is a great place for that. So a video that we've been working on is this music video, what happens when gravity stops working and people just start floating in the air. And it's like really, really good at that. Um, sometimes again, horrible and horrific, but um, yeah, I, I love those types of things of like, you know, what would be something that would cost $8 billion to do in a studio? Let, why don't we try it? And, and I still think, by the way, that there's room to perfect it in a studio. But for me, it's just like, does this idea even have anything in it? And I think so much money is spent on that little part of the process that um, hopefully this can get us to more surreal ideas quicker. Yeah. Because I think if you want to imagine, what does it look like when a thousand light bulbs fall in slow motion onto a ballroom floor? That's going to be pretty expensive to test to see if the shot is something that you want to use. And or at least do two takes of it. You yeah, know? You, it's going to be a very difficult second yeah. take of that. But and here you can play around with the ideas. And I'm curious on the filmmaker side, being a filmmaker, are you able to put things like the camera pans from left to right as it shows it, or it should be in the style of, you know, French 1930s silent cinema. Can you give it those sorts of instructions? Or Yeah, so OpenAI, we got to, like, talk to Altman and all those people, and he said, what would you do? And I said, I would take Sora to film school. And they go, what do you mean by that? And I say, like, it doesn't understand what a zoom in right. works. Or so a like dolly. A dolly, a lot of the times I am tricking it. I'm using like common language to do that, which is something by the way that you do on a film set where you go, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, kind of like this, but um, that's something that I think over time would be really great to, to hone in on is like understanding subject, understanding shot type, understanding lens type, again, there's ways to trick it into that, trick it into styles, um, but it's, a, it's an area for improvement and growth. Yes, and I think it's something I've seen that, that there's limited abilities in, in Runway, which is another one of these kinds of text to video, where you can put the, the camera movement in it and you know describe in blunt terms what you want the movement to be, which for filmmaking is so important. Is there another question? Ah, yep, yeah, there's a gentleman here. You got a microphone? Yeah. Um, in order to, with the objective of uh, keeping... Close, the, close to your mouth. Yes, is it better? Yeah. Uh, with the objective of keeping the character as consistent as possible through the transitions of the clips, I've had a problem with that in my prompts. I work with 2D generative uh, AI, and every time it just is a different complete environment with different um, objects inside. I dealt with like vehicles rather than uh, living creatures, but it was not consistent. Consistency is a problem. It's, 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 it's a bug right now. Um, something that I've been doing recently to keep consistency is um, in image to image, almost making the first image, the last image, and like trying to make, trying to make it so that I'm consistently always ending and starting with the same image so that there is, rather than telling it, hey, dream up something completely new, dream up a girl with red hair or something like that. I try to make it so that my first image and my last image are bookending each other so that there's a consistency there. But again, like, I think that the stage that we're at now, like, a lot of the shots in Airhead were from behind. And the reason for that is to make it consistent. And if you go back and watch that film, the balloon changes size and it changes body and it changes all of these things. So 
I think another challenge that I would like maybe give to you is like, okay, it's inconsistent. Now what? Instead of trying to say, hey, you're, do what I want you to do, my question is, what are the limitations and how do you make a story within the limitations as opposed to trying to fight them? And the technology is going to get better. We're going to get to the point where we overcome those things. But I think that, um, I think that in general, filmmaking is about limitations, not about uh, a buffet of options. And so I would challenge you to work within the limitations as opposed to get frustrated by them. And that, that game-changing moment, I think, is going to come when you're able to say a blonde man with blue eyes walks down the street and then in the next shot, a, blonde, a guy with blonde hair and blue eyes walks into a coffee shop and it's the same guy. Until we can get to the point where it's that, you're not going to really see stuff with actors, long form. I don't know. Depends on the story. Yeah. D well, depends it on the story. It abstract and, as you say. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's, for me... I, I like that limitation. For the question for me is, okay, well, what does it, how do we actually make that thing? Because that's, that's an interesting challenge. And, but uh, if you were making a $100 million rom-com for Disney with two lead actors... Are they around? Because uh, I have some ideas for them. Um, they just left. They just left, damn. They went to the Shiba party. Um, the... the for me, I think that there's ways around that. The other thing that I would say is this idea that like AI is the solution and is the end of the conversation, I think is like a very one dimensional thing. Like, yes, if you want all of your actors to be generated, then yes, we might be a little ways away from that. That being said, if you want to go shoot a whole bunch of stuff and then add AI to it afterwards, I think you're gonna have a lot more success as to where we are in the timeline of, of AI filmmaking. Absolutely. Well, I know we have one more question, but you can, you can catch us afterwards. We are out of time. I, Walt, I could talk about AI with you all day or most of the day, uh, but it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Please give it Thank up for you. Walt Woodman. Thank you. Yeah, that's great.